This week, we will talk about fast petrol vessels. The defence PSU, Garden Reach Shipbuilders and Engineers, has recently handed over fast patrol vessel ICGS Any Basin to the Indian Coast Guard. It is second in the series of FPVs built by GRSE for the Indian Coast Guard. Fast patrol vessel is a medium-range, high-speed vessel designed to perform multi-purpose operations like patrolling, surveillance and anti-smuggling and search and rescue operations. Now, more than 7,500 km long coastline with 12 major and 185 minor ports are protected by Indian Navy with the support from Indian Coast Guard. And the FPVs play a very important role in this. For more on FPVs and their utilization, we have with us a distinguished panel of guests in the studio today. Let me first introduce the guest to you, beginning with uh, Mr. Hitendra Singh. He is a uh, former DIG, Indian Coast Guard. Uh, we also have with us uh, Etat Commodore Abhijit Singh, Head of uh, Maritime Policy Initiative. And we also have with us uh, Mr. Ajay Banerjee, the Defence Correspondent from the Tribune. Let me begin with you, uh, Mr. Singh. And let's try and understand uh, what exactly are fast patrol vessels and uh, What's their, you know, genesis of their origin? Uh, the Indian Coast Guard was, uh, you know, started sometime in February 77. And basically the requirement to have a Coast Guard was that a lot of smuggling was going on along the Indian coastline. And uh, these smugglers were taking away a lot of our gold and things like that. And the customs department said that we must have boats, high-speed boats to be able to intercept them. Uh, then, uh, initially the Navy used to do that role, but the Navy had slow boats, they were all uh, uh, given to us, uh, given to them by the, the British and they were not of much use. Mm -hmm. So, what we did was that the first lot of uh, boats that were uh, bought, the, the customs imported them from Korea, South Korea. They were, uh, they were high speed vessels, but uh, they, I wouldn't say they were FPVs, they were, you know, fast attack, uh, uh, not fast, uh, patrol boats, fast mm -hmm. patrol boats. So, uh, what happened was that they uh, got those boats from Scholocraft, the Garden Reach shipyard uh, built some of them here also and they were of the speeds of about 24, 23, 20 knots, between 20 to 23 knots or 24 knots. Okay. Okay. Now, what happened was that we, what these, the customs were finding was that whereas in 74, 75, the, the, the smugglers uh, bo had faster boats, you know, uh, they would escape with the, they would uh, put these outboard motors and go at about 35 knots or 30. The, the, we were lacking behind, you know, we, we didn't have enough uh, speed to go there mm -hmm. and we were making fools of ourselves. There was no point of, you know, sort of following a boat and then they are showing you the thumb that, sorry, we were, you are nowhere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it was decided, uh, the Indian Coast Guard decided that we've got to build our ships and boats uh, at speeds m much higher than the customs so that we can get them. Mm -hmm. At least even though we carried a gun, we had the advantage of carrying a gun, but the gun must also come into some range to be able to fire at the fellow. Mm -hmm. So, what we did was that the first lot of these uh, FPVs as we call them, initially it was called the IP, the inshore patrol vessel. We did a, a, a contract with Japan, uh, you know, there was a Japanese shipyard. They were building some very fine ships and uh, light hulls, very light hulls, because uh, the concept of speed is that you must have that much of power to drive that hull, in, in, you know, at a certain speed. Mm -hmm. If this, the hull is heavy, if it's a steel hull, naturally that much of speed will get, because you will need more power. So what happened was that we got these uh, boats from uh, Japan, mm -hmm. they were built there. And then three of them uh, 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 were built in Garden Reach shipyard in uh, Calcutta by transfer of technology and transfer of all the equipment that was brought here. Okay. Uh, the idea was to let them learn how to build these boats. Okay. And that's how we initially started, okay. you know, with the, these boats being built in Garden Reach shipyard. Follow these were subsequently followed on by the uh, Mazgon docks, uh, not, Maz not Mazgon docks, uh, Goa shipyard also. Mm -hmm. Goa shipyard also took on them and they also built quite a few of these. But the first, the initial builder was Garden Reach Shipyard. Okay. Annie Besant was the, the same boat which was imported from uh, Japan, Annie Besant, IPV, it was called IPV Annie Besant. Mm -hmm. And she, she was imported from Japan. Then we found that we increased the power and we slightly changed the dimension, lengthened the, the, the ship, so the boat, so that we could get more power. The okay. idea was to design it in such a way. Okay. So, we got MOPA and that's how we call, they call, we call them FPV. Okay. So we'll, we'll, come to, uh, we'll come to various uh, variants and classes and their, uh, you know, uh, specifications yeah, yeah. as well. But let me yeah. bring in, uh, you know, uh, uh, Commerce Singh here. And uh, 
looks like as uh, Mr. Singh is also pointing out, Mr. Hitendri is pointing out that, you know, we started from uh, uh, the import from South Korea and then uh, our own uh, shipyards uh, learned the technology. But uh, it looks like it is now completely indigenized. We are making uh, all, all of them on our own. Much of this is indigenized. But I'd like to just uh, add on to what the Commodore has just said, that it's very important to bring in the context of 2611 to the uh, advances that now we are seeing with the Coast Guard. So one of the things that needs to be mentioned is that 2611, which is the attack on Mumbai in 2008, actually created this urgent imperative for the Coast Guard to modernize. Not just the Coast Guard, but also the Navy in terms of coastal assets and coastal patrolling. And the focus at that time was on getting these fast patrol boats, the fast attack crafts, interceptor boats, because the idea was that there were clearly gaps in our coastal security architecture that needed to be plugged. And for that, it was absolutely necessary that we bring in these fast moving assets that can help us keep a track of activities in our near seas. And so I think it's significant that we that every few sort of weeks we get to hear of these new, you know, fast moving boats that are being included uh, within our uh, within our arsenal, so to speak. But uh, but I, I actually want to make a broader point, which is that the modernization of the Coast Guard, actually, if we, if we look look at it closely, has been actually quite a headline grabbing event. It's really not grabbed headlines in the way that it should have. Much of the focus has been on the Navy, but it's been significant to see the manner in which the Coast Guard has modernized over the past, just over, over the past five years. Mm -hmm. If you look at events of the past one year, it will be clear to you that there are a number of big platforms, 2,000 ton plus platforms that, that the Coast Guard has commissioned. There's been the Vijaya, the uh, Vijaya class in which the Veera uh, uh, and, 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 and others as also now the Sanchet class. Mm -hmm. Just recently, I think earlier this month, the, the third of the Sanchet class was uh, the, uh, the Sajag has been, has been launched. And the Coast Guard has given out a very clear message that the Coast Guard will amp up its assets in the manner of not just a law enforcement agency, but actually a, a military agency. Mm -hmm. It's really not military, but the manner in which it has upgraded itself and creditably has been quite in the in the nature of a military. Okay. And in and in this, I think it has been supported somewhat by the uh, by the central government. It has got it has got enhanced budgets, and also there has been a very clear understanding between the Coast Guard and the Navy that there will be a productive partnership in the Commons. So what we see now happen is that the Coast Guard is building up its assets. It is taking uh, responsibility, it is taking ownership of the events and the activities in the near seas. It's keeping a very close watch on what's happening there. It's ably supported by the Navy that doesn't quite play the premier role in the commons, but is a very, is, is a driving force behind what the Coast Guard is doing today. So I think that these developments, if you see them in total, if you, if you, if you look at this in, in conjunction with the developments in the Navy and the manner the Navy is also contributing to Coast Guard, I think this, the, 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 the advances have been significant. Okay. Uh, Ajay, quite uh, interesting and quite significant as well when you we talk about coastal security and the way, as uh, Abhijit has pointed out, uh, you know, the Indian Coast Guard has uh, ramped up its resources. Uh, it has. See, Vishal, we first have to go back to the turning event which uh, Abhijit also spoke about. Mumbai attacks, when a boat comes in unguarded, sees and it comes into Bombay and 166 people die in the subsequent 72 hours. This was the most audacious terrorist attack. The kind of architecture built after that mandated that the Indian Navy was the overall command and Coast Guard and the Navy would work together. They are working together brilliantly. With regards to these fast patrol crafts, I am very clear that they are the crafts to go because please understand for your viewers, uh, the Arabian Sea has got a very shallow shelf. That means the bigger ships cannot go into those creeks and narrow uh, water bodies which need to be guarded. Mm -hmm. Now the fast patrol vessels have quicker speeds. They have now, I believe, reached about 35, 36 knots. A knot, to tell your viewers, is around 1.8 kilometers is one knot. So that translates into around 65, 66 kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. Now, this looks very uh, infantile in a land-based scenario, but at sea, 66 kilometers per hour is a huge speed, I must tell your viewers. Uh, is, it can beat larger warships. It can outrun, outpace several other things. In, in far as the Coast Guard work goes, it remains within that uh, guarding role. Whereas the Navy uses it, it has used some of these, uh, they call it the fast attack craft. Uh, they have used it in anti-piracy patrols closer okay. to our, our shores. And even this, uh, one of the fast attack crafts even apprehended a pirate boat and even brought it down. This was around 2012 or 2013. But uh, these ships are here to stay or these vessels are here to stay. 
because of the following reasons, Vishal, very briefly. Because we need, the shallow waters need fast movement. The huge naval warships cannot turn around. Two, these ships are now interconnected. They have got good comfort levels, air conditioned comfort levels, quieter engines and longer endurance at sea. They have endurance for around six to seven days at sea, mm -hmm. the smaller boats. Now, this also means the new technology which has come in connects these boats or these vessels to the maritime centers which are at Jamnagar, Bombay and other places. Communication. Yeah, communication. They are connected. A live picture is being communicated to the commanders uh, of the area to, on these vessels and these boats. They have a wider picture of the area and they all are connected via the recent developments which have taken place since 2008, the Mumbai attacks. And these developments mean that these boats or the, the men on these boats can keep an eye on illegal fishing can keep an eye on smugglers who have, uh, uh, unfortunately, the smugglers or pirates have got better technology than, uh, than such government-aided funds of the other countries also and our country also. Okay. So these vessels are here to stay, Vishal. Okay. Uh, let me bring you uh, again, you know, uh, Mr. Hitindran, on, on, on the aspect here, uh, the different classes of FPVs which we have in terms of the Indian Coast Guard's arsenal. And as Abhijit was pointing out, we're building upon it. There are more... Uh, uh, which are being built by uh, the shipyards and will be handed over to the ICGS. But uh, what are the uh, you know different characteristics of different classes which we have, and what are the what are we building upon in terms of technologies which we have? Uh, some of them pointed out by Abhijit here. Uh, firstly, let me uh, give uh, the full credit to the Indian shipyards. We are now building these ships totally in India, and hmm. we are not only building them in India. We are giving some of them to our neighboring countries also. You know, we've given, uh, I think, boats to Mauritius and, and uh, you know, Sri Lanka. They, we built ships for them. Okay. So, as far as naval technology is concerned, I think we are right ahead. The problem uh, is Coast Guard doesn't require a very high uh, level of, uh, you know, attack capability or something. They don't you need mm -hmm. missiles or something as long as they have some good guns. We are okay. We can fire and shoot and, uh, you know, get hold of a smuggler or... Um, uh, you know, a uh, trawler, uh, mm -hmm. fishing trawler or any such, uh, you know, terrorist coming in, into mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, uh, I think what we, what we early decided was that we, sh like uh, just pointed out um, by my friend here, he's, uh, this, we needed ships to be able to go into creeks and narrow areas. Mm -hmm. So we did a uh, we did a little bit of uh, this thing. You see, all most of naval ships and also these these ships are all run by propellers, which extend through a shaft at the bottom. And what happens is when the sh sh she goes into shallow, we have had cases where the ship is run aground. You know, the the, the the thing was not run. So we said, all right. I think to save this, we went in for uh, water jet propulsion technology. You know, the jet propulsion like you have in aircraft. Mm -hmm. We went for water jet propulsion, and a lot of these boats. We were, as uh, you know, again, uh, as it was said, this, those boats were are very high speed boats. They're 40 knots, 45 knots, you mm -hmm. know. And but they, we fitted them with jets, which uh, two th two jets and three jets, so that they can go into very shallow water. Even if there's a, the water is about a, a, say about 12 inches, it will be able to go through and you okay. know, it'll not get stuck. Okay. So we have got a very varied uh, this thing of these boats, and. Uh, in the sense that as far as the Coast Guard is concerned, it's going, it's growing, you know, day to day, it's growing. The government is giving it enough funds, after, especially after the, the attacks, uh, you know, the, this thing. Okay. And uh, I suppose um, uh, the, in the war, during war, we play number two to the Navy. The Navy is the main fighting force, but mm -hmm. they expect us to do the patrols and look around and all this sort of thing. So we are there to assist them. And more, more significant is during the peacetime as we're talking about the coastal security. That's, coastal that's security is, uh, let me tell you then, then I let me tell you one thing. Mm -hmm. There now with all the kind of force that we have, the uh, number of fast patrol vessels and the bigger patrol vessels, the offshore patrol vessels, we, there is never a, a, a place which is not guarded by all the time, 24 hours, 7, it is, uh, there is a Coast Guard ship patrolling the coastline somewhere or the other. Okay. That's, that's quite a, a, you know, a improvement uh, from the scenario which we had almost a decade earlier. Yeah, that, that is. You see, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that we would be remiss if we uh, limited this discussion just to the patrolling effort. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that the Coast Guard these days, contrary to popular opinion, does much more than just patrol. Okay. In the sense that it, it's, it's in, one, in one sense, it's a constabulary force and it does law enforcement. But growingly, there is a realization that the Coast Guard is a multifaceted agency. And it is the most potent agency, the premier agency in the near seas. 
uh, and I would actually place it at a higher pedestal than maybe even the Navy, which is which is too busy with with the Farsis and doing the uh, uh, the international maritime diplomacy. So if we really look at the developments over the past few years uh, since uh, uh, 2611, it would be clear that because the Marine Police hasn't quite stepped up to the plate in the way that it was expected to, the Coast Guard is actually doing the bulk of the heavy lifting in the near seas. Now, patrolling is just one part of it. The fact of the matter is that other than uh, duties like anti-poaching, anti-trafficking, uh, you know, uh, uh, anti-smuggling, etc., the Coast Guard also does a great amount of search and rescue. The Coast Guard also does humanitarian assistance. The Coast Guard also does control of marine pollution mm -hmm. and migration control. These are all areas that require specialist uh, training and they require a, spe a very specialist capability and that the Coast Guard has gradually been acquiring. So I would say that just limiting this conversation to uh, patrolling and the effort that the Coast Guard puts in patrolling, which is significant, would actually really be missing the, missing the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that's important, and, I would, and this is a thing that I would like to lay some stress on, that the Coast Guard increasingly has what is now called as soft power potential. So, other than the navies that do a great deal of maritime diplomacy, okay. actually it is the Coast Guards also that have been doing a great deal of soft power projection. Mm -hmm. The Coast Guards, contrary to the navies that are seen to be aggressive and that you know that, that, that are seen to be provocative in the way that they deploy in, uh, in other countries' littorals, the Coast Guard is seen as a benevolent do-gooder force. So when the Coast Guard goes to another country, it's there in their waters, it is almost welcomed because they know that they are providing a service, a service to the people, a service for human security, and that is welcomed. And so if you look at the number of exercises that now we do with countries like Japan, uh, Coast Guard uh, exercises with Japan, with the US, with the Philippines, with Indonesia, you would be surprised to see that the Coast Guard is actually making strides in the Department of Maritime Diplomacy. Just recently, one of our ships had visited Indonesia. There is this, uh, every year there is a, now a dialogue of Asian Coast Guard heads. Uh, last year, uh, this year it was in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. But now, not, e not just India, but even Bay of Bengal countries are actually... Uh, projecting their coast guards as instruments of foreign policy. So let's not limit the coast guard to just the near seas. It does play a role in the near seas. It does have a very important role in coastal security. But I would say that this is a force that has come into its own uh, in, in a broader sense also. And I don't want to uh, want to make a comparison. It would be a false comparison to the Navy that has its own role to play. Mm -hmm. And the coast guard has over a period of time gotten over some of the differences that it had with the Navy. It did want to project itself not as a supernumerary force or the or or, or, or as a second fiddle force, but as a premier agency in which it has been able to. Okay. And what is, again, the, my last point here would be that what's again significant is that the Navy has actually supported the transformation that the Coast Guard has shown. The Navy has been happy for the Coast Guard to take the lead in the, in the, in the territorial seas and, in, and the lead in matters of, of law enforcement and, and, and constabulary. And the Navy has actually helped this transformation come about. So if you look at the exercises that we are doing with the Coast Guard, Sea Vigil, that was held earlier this year, we do Sagar Kavach with them, which is a which is a very interesting because it actually involves about fifteen or fifteen or nearly twenty agencies mm -hmm. from the central government, the uh, the the, uh, the Coast Guard, the, the the Marine Police, the Customs, and we do this uh, uh, near the seas every few months. We do it in conjunction with many other agencies that help the Navy and the Coast Guard do the exercises. So I think it's been a positive story so far. Okay. And then and, and both uh, Indian Navy and uh, Coast Guard have had that, uh, you know, wonderful coordination amongst themselves. But uh, uh, Ajay, uh, would you uh, agree to this uh, point which is being put forth by Abhijit that as far as Coast Guard is concerned, you know, it's like a soft power projection? Undoubtedly, because uh, see, we track these developments uh, around the year. There's these uh, important Coast Guard meetings with the Japanese Coast Guard. Now, Japanese Coast Guard came here. We had a exercise also with them. Now, this signifies that the Coast Guard is being propped by the government, one. And two, when you look at the assets, when we visit these <coughs> assets, the assets of the Coast Guard, especially the ships, the surface ships, are almost at par with the Navy in terms of facilities for the sailors. That is a very important aspect because air conditioning, the engines have to be quieter. They have to be having very good the maintenance facilities. Mm -hmm. Those, when they remain there, means that they are with the, at par with the Navy, those ships of the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. Also, interestingly, Coast Guard also flies donor aircraft for surveillance, which is also used by the Navy. They also do Cheta Chita helicopter flying, which is also used by the Navy, and they are also using the ALH in some areas, which is okay. also used by the Navy. As uh, Abhijit rightly pointed out, Navy has actually propped up the Coast Guard to look after the waters which are closer to us, say 
100 nautical miles, 150 nautical miles, and the Navy remains out at sea. When you look at the coordination when it happens, recently in, Oct uh, in September, there was uh, two boats which were sailing in from Pakistan. There was an alert and the Joint Coordination Center sent out a Coast Guard ship and a naval helicopter had flown over it and seen and told the Coast Guard ship that there is this is the location and you come over here. That kind of coordination exists between the two forces. Okay. And, and the Coast Guard, when it joins into the Navy's wider game plan of the exercises of sea vigil on the West Coast, improves or rather adds to the Coast Guard's operational abilities and also see how to operate in front of adversity and also to operate in rough seas. Coast Guard has been doing it for long, but naval ships are huge. They are much bigger than the Coast Guard ships. But whereas the government is concerned and the Navy is concerned, I am very sure that they have given Coast Guard the entire backing to be partners, not be second partners, but be partners in the coastal security program, which was drawn up after the Mumbai attacks. Mm -hmm. They have joint cooperation centers, they have joint coordination centers, and they have joint even uh, centers for imagery. I have seen Coast Guard and Navy people operate together in those uh, IMAC centers. IMAC is in information management systems centers, which the Navy and the Coast Guard have come up okay. after the Mumbai attacks. They operated jointly. They okay. are like together like... Uh, uh, there is no flaw in, or there is no chasm between the two forces. So that is why I believe that the Coast Guard has, as VG is pointing out, has a wider role, not just patrolling the seas on a Dornier or a helicopter or on a, on a ship. They have a wider role. Okay. Uh, let me uh, bring in uh, Mr. Hidendra again here on uh, the last question, last aspect, and coming back to what we started with, that's uh, the platform, you know, the FPVs. Uh, and uh, in, in all these aspects, which uh, all of you are pointing out, Abhijit, you and Ajay as well, and the role of the Coast Guard, uh, Platforms like FPVs do play an important role. But from an end user's perspective and from Coast Guard's perspective, what is it that uh, you know the Coast Guard might be seeking in terms of what more the FPVs can pack itself with or maybe you know something else which the Coast Guard might have? Uh, well, actually, the FPV's role, uh, FPV's role is defined. You know, it is, as Abhiji uh, talked about it, search and rescue, uh, fisheries protection, all that is there. That, that's all uh, sort of covered. And I think uh, there is nothing more that they can add at the moment unless uh, they want to put in a better weapon. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. The, uh, whereas the Navy is, carries missiles, the, we could have a, a gun which is, have bigger range or that sort of a thing. Okay. That is the only thing that they, they can look forward to at the moment. There is okay. nothing very much they want. But I, I must uh, uh, bring out one thing to you mm -hmm. and very significant is that we found that initially the, the the assets of the navy uh, the coast guard cost much less than the assets of the navy you know you you uh, the, the same asset for the navy uh, uh, cost multiplies a uh, number of times okay the and also the back back uh, back support which you require you know the like to run the navy for every uh, three ships out or something you you must have uh, you know three people ashore to help them here you've got one person and the rest are all all, all the time patrolling. You okay. know, the backup support is... Okay. Uh, uh, let me bring uh, Abhijit and Ajay on, on the last aspect, and that's quite an in, important mm -hmm. one as well, though uh, both of you touched on it in your initial comments. That's the indigenization aspect, you know, the way uh, it's we our uh, shipbuilders have supported this concept of going ahead and ramping up the resources of Coast Guard and as well as uh, Indian Navy. We have uh, discussed that quite a number of times, Abhijit. And then Ajay. Well, on the uh, indigenization aspect, I have to say that the Indian uh, shipbuilding uh, yards have broadly been supportive. Uh, GRSC has quite a few projects that it is doing, but the coastal project is one of the major projects that it is doing. Similarly, uh, Goa Shipyard that just uh, launched the Sachet is also uh, mm, contributing to the effort in a really big way. Okay. I think that uh, one of the problems that has actually not come up in this discussion, and which should, is that after 26-11, uh, the Coast Guard came up with a very ambitious plan to nearly triple the size of its assets. Now, it is on its way, and a lot of these projects that are now seeing the light of day are the ones that were uh, uh, that got underway uh, around 2010 to 2011. Uh, but uh, off late, the Coast Guard has faced some problems with regard to its budgets. Okay. For instance, last year there were complaints from the Coast Guard uh, leadership that just about 50% of its projected requirement was actually met. So what I suspect is that, or what I expect to happen in the next few years is that the Coast Guard might find it hard to actually stick to that timeline that it has stuck to itself because there's definitely going to be a shrinking of budgets. Okay. The Coast Guard also might face a problem with manpower.
manpower. Manpower has been a huge problem for the Coast Guard, not as much for the Navy, more for the Coast Guard. And with technology, the fact is that a lot of this technology that we see uh, being inducted in the, into, into the uh, Coast Guard was contracted, uh, contracted sometime early. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of the technology that the Coast Guard wants is extremely expensive technology, which we might take uh, some time in getting. So I think we should be focused on the challenges that are there with regard to uh, the, uh, the Coast Guard. But I think we sh th this should not detract from the fact that this has by and large been a success story. Okay. Uh, Ajay. See, indigenization, Navy has been the leader of all the three forces. That, let us be very, very clear. They are making an aircraft carrier on their own, designed and made on their own. We have made a nuclear submarine on our own, designed and made on our own. Hull was made in India. The other six submarines, the Calvary class the, from, the, from the Naval Group, which was earlier called the Scorpion, DCNS Scorpion, was also being made in India. And also the warships. Keep in mind, Vishal, in the past 10, 15 years, we make our own steel-grade ship. Uh, sorry, uh, ship grade steel, mm -hmm. right? We also make a lot of stuff, electronics, the, the displays are all made by Bell, Bharat Electronics Limited. Same goes for the ships which are with the Coast Guard. Okay. And also a lot of part which goes into wiring, harnessing, cabling, uh, tooling, which is all made in India. Largely, naval ships today have close to 90% of indigenous content when it concerns the ship's structure, close mm -hmm. to 90%. And in the fight capability, we are lower because the guns and the equipment are still to be made. But it is increasing because the BrahMos is made here now. So the BrahMos, when it is installed on the ship, the percentage of the indigenous content goes up. Okay. In case of Coast Guard, there are no such missiles being attached to the ships or being...